As consoles and computers evolve over time, games that run on older tech often die out or get dropped, but never Tetris. It was a smash hit in the arcades of the 80s, Game Boys of the 90s, flip phones of the 2000s, even today it's one of the top games in most app stores. Over 40 years of continuous success, Tetris racked up hundreds of millions of downloads, making it untouchably the most successful video game of all time, until it was beaten by Minecraft. The sheer scale of Minecraft success might be surprising to some people, but anyone who's ever played this game knows that while it might look like it's just a few blocky hills and a dragon, the truth is that Minecraft is anything and everything you need it to be. There's no better place to demonstrate that than here in the game zone. It may not look like much yet, but in today's episode, we're going to transform it into a spot where people can build and play all the mini games they love the most, whether it's Leaf's Belief, mini golf, parkour, or maybe even Tetris. As I do that, I'll go over a few pointers on how to create efficient and usable transportation networks. This is a pretty underrated and underused aspect of this game, but I guarantee you that whether you're connecting your base to farms on the other side of your world, or just laying out some dirt paths around a small village, improving the quality of the journey between your builds can do just as much for your appreciation of this game as the builds themselves do. To anyone wondering what qualifies me to give people tips on city planning and road network design, I should probably point out that I live in Canada, the only place in the world where you can drive to three oceans, home to the busiest highway in the world, and also home to a civil engineer who often goes by dinghy fried. I uh, probably should have started with that last one. <laughs> but yeah, for those that don't know, I'm a civil engineer, which is basically a Minecraft builder but in real life. I've designed all sorts of structures, like buildings and bridges, and I've also designed the layout for a wide variety of transportation networks, including roads, pedestrian trails, marinas, and rail lines. A lot of the techniques I use in real life are super helpful in the game, so I thought I'd share some of them with you today. I'll admit I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to all these things. I could probably make a several series covering just this one topic in excruciating detail. But don't worry, I'm going to do my best to spare you from that side of me today. <laughs> we're going to keep things as simple as possible. So let's just put it this way. We're going to connect people to places. Let's start with a specific example to demonstrate what I mean. The place I have in mind is right through this portal here. This is the base of a fellow meerkat called Nalira. Or I think that's what they're called. I don't actually know how to pronounce their name. <laughs> As you can see, Nalira has set herself up on this stunning flower forest island. She's got this awesome clifftop house overlooking the sea. It's a beautiful spot, and it's pretty central to our world map. But except for her nether portal, there's no easy way to reach her base. Let's determine which people and which places we need to connect her to, and connect them all using a network. A network might sound like a fancy and complicated term, but all there is to it is to put dots on any of the destinations, we're going to call those nodes, and lines connecting them, and we're going to call those paths. So nodes and paths. To create a network, first, mark out all the places on a map with nodes. Okay, so Nalira's base is here. This is where Nalira spends most of her time, so we need to connect her island to the other places she often travels to, including the shopping district and world spawn. She also might be hosting or maybe even visiting the two meerkats she probably spends most of her time collaborating with. Those are Lynn and Talon. Second, draw a line, which we'll call a path, between any two destinations that people often travel between. And just like that, we've built ourselves a network. Cool. So now that we know where all these paths need to go, we just need to work out how people are going to travel along them. All these lines have to travel across water. So these can't really be walking paths or horse trails. We could maybe put some boats and docks along the shore. 
place a few buoys along the ocean to stop people getting lost along the way. But to get to Talons, Nalira would have to travel all the way around this continent. We could lay out an elytra course, maybe add the occasional pit stop for rockets along the way, but her friends are so far away that by the time she arrived at their bases, she'd have to leave again to go repair her wings. Hmm. Do you know what could be perfect though? The subway! Oh my goodness, I love the subway, and it's been way too long since I last worked on it. I reached out to Nalira and asked if she'd be interested in a station of her own, and she said yes. We're actually gonna add a brand new line today, and that line is gonna serve the network that we've just built, as well as a couple other bases along the way. Eventually, it's gonna look something like this, but we don't have time for all of that today, so let's just make a start for now. I've already connected the shopping district to spawn along the existing tunnels by adding a second set of rails, but to get from here to Nalira, we're gonna have to build a whole new section. For her tunnels, Nalira has asked for an amethyst geo theme, which I'm really excited about. She's also asked that her station be called Shimmering Heights. We've got a lot of building to do today, so let's just get right into it. Here we go! So we're not quite finished, there's still a few details to get sorted out, but I've stopped the time lapse because I've actually just learned that Zoe's online. We've got to go meet her in our new Feels Like Home office to discuss a business opportunity. So why don't we ride our new subway line over to the shopping district? I've tried my best here to make these underground tunnels look a bit like you're traveling through a series of geodes, but for the water section I wanted to try something a bit more mesmerizing. I've used all the different sizes of amethyst crystals to tie in with the station's theme, but instead of just making more geodes, I've tried to make it seem like you're traveling through a huge kaleidoscope. I wasn't sure whether this would turn out the way I expected to, but I'm really happy with the results. Hello. <laughs> you look it so funny like... on that thing. It's bobbing up Hello. and down. Oh, no, oh no, goodness. Go back, go back, go back, go back. <laughs> Wow, the office looks amazing. Thank you. So I understand you're in the market for a harbor. Uh, yes. Okay. Is that something that you? Yes. Your so... facility would be able to assist me with. I hope. My thought is that we would have little ships or like little speedboat mm. in the marina, like just in that little cove there, and then people who outside of the marina like just let people go all the way around the island with ships because we're gonna run out of land soon and so that's the perfect opportunity for people to build ships you know whether it be for shops or just for having a boat yeah, with a, a boat. pool on it i who mean who doesn't want a boat <laughs> <laughs> yeah who doesn't want a boat exactly <laughs> yeah as for the actual build style did you have anything in mind because we've got the boardwalk which is sort of like a semi-contemporary European thing going on on the south and the north is sort of more of like a medieval tutory thing and and then you know we got the castle which is just sort of like vague mushroom themed I don't really know how to describe it better than that I don't totally have in mind what it would look like I mean I if I had built it without your expertise I would have built the whole thing out of spruce wood because it's my favorite wood um, I think I'll match into the like roads and the castle theme and and even That's like the marketplace. Mm -hmm. I was thinking we should keep the color scheme just because 
it looks good. I like it. Because mm-hmm. I wasn't really sure, like, how to build it. Because usually when I build, like, docks and stuff, they're usually only, like, three or four spaces wide. They're not usually too wide. Right. So I think I might talk to Henners. He seems to be our, our yes, server's he... boat builder. Hmm. We're going to call him the Master of Ships. Okay. Whether he likes it or not. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm going to talk to him and work out like, oh, okay, so how wide do you think a boat would be? And then maybe That's give what some I was extra about. leeway on top of that. As you know, I've got my uh, my subway system that I've been working on. I thought, hey, why not, uh, why not branch out into more types of public transit? So I thought I could set up some kind of ferry where it brings you sort of along all the canals and between all the boats and things. Yeah, I trust you to do a good job. So do whatever <laughs> makes your heart happy. If you were to name the ferryman, what would you name it for our, uh, our Chives. new nautical... J- Jives? Chives. Chives. C-H-I-V-E-S. I could mm. not tell you why. Well, but a, yeah, a show for named Chives is what you will have. Yeah, um, and chives, chives, like the onion. That was, a, I was going to ask. I thought, like, okay, I thought that was. <laughs> I right. can't tell you why. It's just, it's always been, like, something I wanted, so. You sure didn't mean Jeeves? <laughs> no, chives. Chives. Okay. Okay, well, I'm intrigued. It sounds exciting. Mm-hmm. You just have to design it, and then I will right. help you build it, right. or all of us can help you build it. Right, or so... I'll pay extra and you can build all of it. <laughs> well, that was fun. I'm definitely excited to start laying out that marina for Zoe. And I think I've already got a couple cool ideas in mind that I'm excited to show you. Maybe at some point in the next episode, we'll have to go and see Henners to talk about that. But I think that'll have to wait because, as I said, we've got a lot of building to do today. All right, so we're back here in the game zone. As you can see, this place needs a complete overhaul before we can even start to lay out any roads. First, we're going to get rid of all the mushrooms. We can always grow them back later if we want, but right now I kind of just want to get a lay of the land and they're a bit in the way. Then I'm going to transform the terrain from this chaotic mess into a few large but very flat areas. Now that's not something I would recommend if you're planning a city that you're going to build all by yourself. Because natural variations in the terrain really do add a lot of character to a build. But this is an important step for something like a minigame area or a shopping district, where you want your plots to be as easy as possible for all the server members to build on. <laughs> if I'm honest, I'm a little intimidated by this task, and I think this might end up taking quite a bit of time. But uh, <laughs> enough, enough stalling. I think I've just got to rip the band-aid, get it started. Here we go. Huh.
<sighs> okay, so you probably just watched a very long time lapse. I'll admit that was a little bit grueling, but thank goodness it's out of the way, because we can move on to the fun stuff. So this is what the terrain looks like now. There's loads of flattened ridges, a couple ravines, maybe even a couple small patches of natural terrain, just in case someone wants it. But for the most part, I flattened out the Mushroom Island to approximately the same elevation as the central area. With the flat terrain, it'll be a lot easier for people to start building their games. They just need to have some roads to put them against. So let's work out where those need to be. We're going to plan out this game zone as if it were a city. By dividing the land into districts, neighborhoods, and build plots, then connecting them all with an efficient road network. There are as many ways to go about this as there are cities across the globe. I'll only be able to make use of a handful of those methods as I plan out this game zone, but as we go through them, I'll try and share a few real life examples of cities that did things differently in case you find them inspiring when developing your own cities. Let's get a quick refresher on our steps for building a road network and work out how to apply them to our game zone. One, place nodes on destinations. Two, draw paths to connect any nodes people often travel between. And three, build infrastructure, in our case roads, along any unsupported paths. Now, the first thing I want to specify is that not all cities do these steps in this order. Some cities start off the bat by building their roads first, then working out where to put their buildings second. These are called planned cities, and they can look stunning on paper, but in practice, cities are living, breathing, organic creatures that grow and change constantly and chaotically. Restricting cities to such a rigid framework often denies them the flexibility they need to develop and thrive naturally. While this degree of planning isn't ideal for conventional cities, it can be a perfect solution for temporary or smaller settlements that don't need to grow or change over time, such as military camps or upscale neighborhood developments. I want my city to feel more organic, so I'm going to start with a small seed and have my city grow out from that bit by bit, hopefully into something unique, unexpected, and full of character. I'll do that by placing just a few nodes to begin with, then repeating our three steps over the course of a few stages, each time adding more nodes, more paths, and more roads. I'm going to break up this process by starting big, and then working my way down to smaller scales. However, if I were planning a city that had a more immersive history, I might split these stages into various historical eras instead. Because cities often carry the scars of their past in pretty unexpected ways. Alright, so let's pull up a map of our nicely landscaped island and get to work. For this first stage, we need to represent the entire world with just a handful of nodes. But don't worry, that's not as tricky as it sounds. I just need to work out where people are entering and leaving our city's network. That could be a harbor, an airport, a city gate, something like that. For now, there's only one easy way to reach the game zone, which is through this nether portal. Eventually though, I'm also hoping to connect this place to the subway network, so I've reserved this little island out here for a future station. Okay, moving on to step two, your instincts might tell you to connect these two nodes with a path, but let's check if that actually makes sense. If you remember, paths represent the citizen's desire to travel between various nodes. And it's very unlikely that someone would ride the subway all the way out here, only to immediately leave through the nether. If they're here, they're probably here to play games, so we don't need to connect these two nodes directly. Since we have no paths, we don't need any roads, so we can shrink our focus down to the city scale. At this stage, we're representing the city as a whole with nodes. This could be any structures or squares designed to house or serve your entire city at once. You can also mark out a city center, which represents a major road, intersection, or square in the heart of your downtown core. You can have more than one city center, and it definitely doesn't have to be in the literal center of your city. My city center is going to be this big hexagon. I placed it here pretty arbitrarily, so don't read too much into its location. Okay, this time we've finally got some paths to add. People will be traveling to our city from elsewhere in the world, and vice versa. Therefore, I'm going to connect my city center to both of our external connections. Now that we know where people want to go, we can add our first roads. One thing worth noting is that while the subway's fun, it's not fast. So it's pretty safe to assume most people are going to travel here via the nether. Since this nether path will be busier than the one to the subway, I'll make sure that its road can carry more people at once by making it wider. Okay, our city stage is complete, so let's narrow our focus once again. 
Before we can start the stage, we've got to divide our city into districts. I'm going to split mine based on the terrain, but you can do this using whatever criteria you want. Also, it's worth noting that while my districts lie next to each other, some cities are divided vertically instead. Just like last time, we're going to begin by marking out any place that could house or serve the entire district's population at once, like a huge shopping center or a big park. Just as we gave the city a city center, we're going to give each district a district center. Okay, now let's think about where we need to put our paths this time. Once meerkats have traveled to the island and reached the city center, they're going to head straight to the district containing their favorite game. To make sure they can do that, I'm going to connect the city center to each district. Now let's imagine all the meerkats have played their first game. Some may then choose to leave right away, but others might stick around and play one more. They can get to the games in all the other districts by traveling back through the city center, which makes sense if they're headed across the island, but if they're only headed to the next district over, they probably want a shortcut. As a reminder, these paths make sense for the game zone, but a conventional city is going to be much more complex. Depending on the culture, geography, or land use of each district, people may not want to travel between them very often. Let's add our next set of roads. Once again, we'll be using wider roads for busier paths. To prevent these roads from using up all the buildable space in my city, I can use some roads to carry more than one path, resulting in wider roads, but fewer unusable spaces. I can also convert some of these to tunnels, making use of space that's already not usable for surface builds. However, the best solution by far is to diversify your network by making use of multiple modes of transportation in your city. That way, instead of sending all of your traffic down a single road, you can have some people take park trails, bike lanes, or public transit options. Eventually, I'm planning to add some game-themed transit modes, like parkour trails, slime launchers, and roller coaster circuits. But that might have to wait for another day. Alright, the city is definitely starting to take shape. Let's move on. You guys know the drill by now. We'll split up each district into smaller neighborhoods, assign nodes to the neighborhood centers, and anything capable of housing or serving the whole neighborhood at once, like a fire station, a chapel, or a community center. Next, we'll connect each neighborhood to its respective district center and add any shortcuts people are likely to take. So now for the roads. In your cities, this is where you might start to reach a certain cutoff point. Rather than delving into the complexities and nuances of tax revenues and expenditure, let's imagine your city doesn't have a government of any kind. If a citizen wants a road, they've got to build it and, crucially, pay for it themselves. If lots of people in your neighborhood are taking the same shortcut, they can pool their money together and afford a road. Maybe even a small bridge or a pedestrian tunnel. However, if it's just one or two people, they might have to settle for a rough and narrow walking trail. Okay, so we've reached our final stage, where we need to divide the remaining usable space into individual plots. I don't know what plot sizes and shapes all the meerkats will need for their builds yet, and many games can range anywhere from a 1x1 one one parkour column to a racetrack the size of this whole island. For community projects like this one, it's best to start by dividing only a portion of your city into smaller plots and designating the rest of the space as a no-build zone. As builds start to pop up and server members share their plans in more detail, you'll get a better sense of which plots, shapes, and sizes you need more of when you divide up and unlock the next portion of the land. Simply for the sake of closure in this tutorial, I'm going to make some wild assumptions and guess that the plots will eventually look something like this. Each one will then get its own node. For the paths, I'm simply going to connect each game to its neighborhood center and leave it there. Direct connections between neighboring properties are definitely a thing, but that's probably something you can work out later on when you're filling your plots with individual builds. We're also going to be stingy with roads at this scale. While I might add a proper road to reach any areas with at least three or four plots, anything less than that will just get a narrow driveway or maybe an alley or something. And with those final touches, we've finished planning our city! It's time to start building the first few roads in worlds, so while I do that, here are a couple mini hacks that can massively improve the atmosphere of your city.
I don't know about you, but I think I've done more than enough building for one episode. If you found today's tutorial useful for planning your own towns, consider leaving a like. And if you want to see more videos like this, make sure you hit that subscribe button. If there are any fellow meerkats watching this, hurry up and build your game so I can play them! If you're not a meerkat, let me know in the comments if you've got any ideas for games you want me to build in a future episode. Either way, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.